our program freely and critically uh, conducted by me, Thomas Kowalowskas and Professor Gendotas Majekis from Vitotas Magnus University in Lithuania, Kaunas. Uh, we work in social and political critique center, and this is our program is one of the many series about uh, various uh, social critique uh, issues, theoretical approaches, political events. And today our special guest is uh, Attila Pok uh, from Hungary, who has worked uh, for 45 years um, in the Hungarian Academy of Science. Today he is a senior researcher in the Hungarian uh, Advanced uh, Research Center in Kyrzyk. Uh, so, uh, uh, dear Professor Pok, uh, we just uh, received from you a book about communism, your your long time uh, research uh, product, and uh, uh, perhaps we can start with the first question. Mm, now, 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of communism, uh, 30 years after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, what is uh, the uh, memory of communism, uh, maybe not only in Hungary, but uh, in East Central European countries, most likely the picture is different in different countries. Yes, of course. So if we started a broader picture, we obviously cannot say that uh, communism as a guiding ideology of a political system would be dead. That is not the case. So think of China for example, where this is admittedly the guiding uh, ideology of the country, and uh, think of uh, some other countries where maybe this is not admitted, but this is the practice. Uh, so I think it is a highly, highly topical issue the, the, from this perspective. The other perspective is that in Hungary during the 20th century, if we also include the 1890 transition, there were nine uh, major political system changes. Now, but we didn't have nine generations. That means that every generation in Hungary, including uh, my generation as well, had to live through one or two or three political systems. And once uh, the uh, communist political system is then collapsed, it doesn't mean that the people who lived during this system have disappeared because these are the same people. And if you have a political system for about uh, 40 years, uh, that leaves an imprint on the mentalities, on the activities of the people for a long time. So communism may be not as a guiding ideology, but a kind of a mentality as the everyday way of doing things uh, did survive. That's why I think that it is uh, important to, to face it. What you can change, what you cannot change. You remember there is this uh, very famous uh, uh, saying by Darendorf uh, that uh, you can uh, change the, the institutional system uh, after the collapse of communism in six months. You can change the, the economic system in six years perhaps, but uh, according to him, changing mentalities, attitudes might take 60 years. And we are now in the 30th, 33rd year, so I think it is still with us. But in my view, but maybe of course I am wrong, it doesn't only mean the imprint is left not only on the people who live through communism, but it can have imprint also on the following generation, because when the next generation observe how their parents are doing things, how their parents reflect on things, they also take over something from this legacy. So it can frequently happen that uh, uh, in a, on a rhetoric level, uh, someone distances himself or herself from communism, but when it comes to dealing with a very concrete, very practical issue, he will, he or she will follow the pattern of communist times. And uh, uh, an additional, perhaps, remark uh, to the topicality of this issue 
I think in uh, Hungary, just as much in, as in many, many former countries of the uh, countries of the former Soviet bloc, uh, uh, continuities and discontinuities are a very important issue. So, uh, whether uh, communism as a 40 year or a other countries longer or shorter period is just a deviation, so off the main track, or 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 an integral part of that history. Politicians uh, have, or I would say, a number of politicians have the tendency to say that well, uh, the organic development means that uh, communism or fascism or any other radical systems were just deviations, and now we are back on the right track. So, and I think this is far from being the case. We cannot simply say that, well, there was a long-standing dictatorship imposed on these countries by the Soviet Union, but fortunately we succeeded in getting rid of this authoritarian, dictatorial, despotic system, and now we can enjoy a happy, free life. So, uh, it is the task of anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists, historians to go deeper into these issues, because uh, if we want to understand why <coughs> uh, uh, tradition, I mean in Western Europe, traditional way of uh, political pluralism cannot be fully established, this uh, uh, calls for explanations, and this is connected to the long-term legacy also of communism. Attila, uh, you know that, uh, uh, yeah, I accept your uh, uh, <coughs> challenge to see deeper than a, a simple authoritarian, communism as authoritarian, some kind of authoritarian power. And I remember uh, that uh, even in our days, uh, the, uh, at least in Lithuania, not only, there are many of uh, young people who would like uh, to continue some communist ideas without uh, without uh, authoritarian inspiration and without any uh, references uh, to Stalin or Gulag. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and ordinarily they uh, uh, refer to the uh, that uh, issues of communism that uh, begin be, began. Uh, even earlier than Marx, uh, you know, that uh, pre-Marx uh, communism, anarchist uh, communism, or social democrats communism, which was different from Bolshevik communism. It means that uh, the phenomenon uh, of communism uh, is much uh, larger, you know, and, uh, it, and the uh, revelation of contemporary a popularity of communism uh, as well is uh, different than uh, just a simple, uh, you know, uh, a revelation <laughs> of Stalinism. Uh, what 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 is uh, the communism according to your point of view in this uh, larger sociological anthropological sense? What it is uh, communism according to you? So I think there is a kind of an internal drive in many people. Uh, a call for equality. If you are uh, at the bottom of a society, this means that you want to climb up on the social ladder. If you are on the top of the social hierarchy, you say, that, well, if I want to live in peace and security, somehow I have to have the people at the bottom, because otherwise I will not be in security either, because it might come to uprisings, revolt, lack of security. So there is uh, this, uh, but uh, uh, when we come to the practical functioning of societies, uh, there are always clashes of interest. So the communist uh, ideology is that, and in a way the fascist as well, that it's quite easy to reconcile uh, different, uh, the interests of various social groups and classes. And once you find the, the proper form of reconciliation, you have to give as much authority as possible to the state, because the state can control this. But unfortunately, practical experiences say that in spite of this tremendous demand among people, it doesn't, 
that's not the reality. It doesn't function. And I'm sure you do not have to be a historian or a politician, but if you have ever managed a smaller or larger business, if you have ever been a leader in a, if, if you ever been a leader who has to make decisions, I am sure you know the experience that you are very much upset by the endless discussions and meetings when you uh, and you keep saying that all oh, these stupid people do not realize what their interests are. I know much better and it will, everything would be much finer and they would also live much better if they just followed my wise instructions. So I think this is the deeper lying, so to say, anthropological or, or, uh, as, or, uh, or social problem. And this is also the reason why a number of people try to uh, find this uh, consolation, so to say, in uh, religious communities where you have uh, an implementation of, of this principle. I have a, a very good friend, for example, who, who found this, uh, uh, who was a very successful businessman, but somehow he got tired of the terrible struggles on the market. And then he found this reconciliation in a Krishna community. Uh, so, uh, and uh, so this shows this internal drive. There are, I also know a lady who was a very, very successful uh, business lady. And then after 20 years or so, she decided to go to into a nunnery. Yes, and become a nun. Yes, so that. Uh, uh, so this is this will be with us uh, all the time. That's why uh, communism. I think the the idea of communism uh, cannot die. Uh, of course, uh, not every dictatorial authoritarian system is a communist one, uh, but uh, there is a tendency uh, to move in this direction. And other important issue in this connection is the role of uh, the privacy sphere, privacy. Because if you let people have much privacy, then you can't keep control over them. So I think that especially in crisis, think of also the present situation, critical problem. Uh, according to some general principles of human rights, you would be allowed to move around, right? But uh, political interests of other people, of other countries, or other systems are against it. So uh, uh, you uh, uh, <laughs> cannot uh, uh, allow people to enter the territory, or many uh, systems do not allow other people, migrants, to enter their territories. And this is an interference into their private lives, yes? Why cannot they make these decisions? You cannot let everyone enter your country, but so that means that there is a willingness to do so, but it cannot be implemented. And there is a kind of a tension on a, it can be on a local level, regional level, national level, international, global level, among these aspirations to call for equality and uh, uh, rule of law, etc. Uh, and it is very good to have institutions like the Pope, for example, who calls for that. But uh, because he, he might keep warning people, but it does imagine if the Pope were the head of a world state, that wouldn't function. <laughs> that wouldn't Attila, fun uh, it, it's very interesting that uh, you uh, uh, mention the concept of reconciliation mm -hmm. in the context of uh, communism and as well communism without religion and communism even without political party of communists uh, uh, as some kind of collective uh, collective intention of uh, <coughs> uh, common reconciliation or uh, communal uh, reconciliation mm -hmm. And it uh, sounds very nice, uh, you know, like love, brotherhood, tovarish, everything, you know, that uh, looks nice, you know, and you mentioned this uh, religion in the context. And from the other side, we see immediately that this uh, beautiful picture of a uh, reconciliated brotherhood transformed into terror actions. 
what's happened that this re, uh, love and friendship communities transform themselves immediately for the reason of power uh, to the highest level of terror? Well, that unfortunately it is, uh, uh, it cannot be avoided. So I think that for, uh, let me give you an example. So I think about 20 years ago or so, I, I remember it up to the present day, a very interesting presentation by an Israeli political scientist, Professor Avignari. And he's an extremely clever political scientist. And he talked about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, relationship and uh, especially the status of Jerusalem. And then he said that the problem, uh, generally the crisis gets deeper if someone comes up with the ultimate solution, so to say that now for I don't know how many years we uh, were fighting each other, but there, if uh, someone uh, <coughs> is proudly announcing this, or you remember when Mr. Bush said mission completed, then definitely then come the terrorists, yes? Then come the radical uh, people from either side, because they will say, no, 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 that is not the case. You cannot uh, resolve all the problems. So I think the, the, the reasonable attitude, so to say, is that you don't solve problems, but you deal with problems. This is also what I was in the management of various institutions. I was also always saying, let us not talk about solving the problem, but let us see how we can deal with the problem. Because uh, the clash of interests, or the clashes of interest, will stay with us. But what kind of uh, <coughs> solutions we can find for uh, damping these uh, clashes, for for uh, living, for living with them? So it, uh, I think, this is the the, the source of terrorism that. Uh, uh, there are uh, these uh, attempts at finding the, the proper, uh, and especially if it is very proudly announced that now we have found the solution. And you know, this was the problem when <coughs> communism uh, emerged as a political system in the, the countries of the Soviet bloc. The communist leader said, well, uh, history should be forgotten, so this is a completely new age. The past has to be wiped out, uh, and now we can build a, 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 a great uh, society. And uh, the louder they were saying this, the more the radical forces were getting more and more uh, organized. Uh, I think so. This, this, is, this is my interpretation. Uh -huh. And and uh, Georg Lukács, uh, you remember this yeah. uh, Hungarian philosopher very famous and uh, who did a very big impact not only on the marxism leninism but as well western marxism and even critical theory you know in the uh, one of his uh, early books uh, history of class consciousness mm -hmm. he emphasized about importance you know this uh, uh, cl uh, class separation, you know, and class consciousness, which is not given, but should be developed and should be even uh, educated, if, if you would like. It's not so simple about class consciousness. But uh, how do you think, uh, how, much, how, how much is important uh, this class consciousness for the, uh, for the spreading of uh, communist ideas and communist feelings? I think uh, today's world is completely different from Lukács' world and the earlier period. Social structures were always uh, very complex, but now if you look at, for example, uh, a person's place in the division of labor and a person's place in the consumption, uh, it is not, uh, uh, cor there is no proper correlation. So people belonging to very different uh, uh, categories in the social hierarchy might uh, uh, consume the same things. Uh, 100 years ago, 
uh, if you were, even I would type type to that, 70, 80s, you were work, walking around in the street, you could easily just, uh, if you looked at how people were dressed and how people were behaving, how people were moving around, you could relatively easily judge their social status. Today, uh, if I look at my students, they all, they come from very different backgrounds. So some fathers are billionaires, <laughs> others, and, and they use the same computers, they use the same telephones, they all wear these rug-like uh, things. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, and uh, if you have this, it's very difficult to develop a collective class consciousness. Because uh, uh, societies are now, I think, much more stratified uh, than, than classes. And uh, also, if you look at, uh, you could say, or, or look at this time, you could say, well, uh, one class of people belongs to the owners of the means of production, uh, and others are exploited by this means of production. But now you know that Hungary has about uh, a labor force of about uh, four, 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 active labor force, four and four and a half million. Now, out of this labor force, about uh, six, seven, eight hundred thousand work in their own small businesses. And what they exploit is mainly themselves. Uh, and uh, of course, you have got the huge. Uh, uh, multinational companies uh, that, who are making huge profits, but uh, uh, in order to be able to make the large profits, of course there are exceptions, but many of them pay their even the lowest ranking employees relatively well. Because for two reasons, on the one hand uh, they want to keep that labor force, on the other they have to consume. So if you don't pay your employee, they, they will, will not consume. And, and without consumption, the whole system would collapse. Therefore, it is uh, much, much more difficult to uh, define, so to say, the real clashes, the real fault lines in a society. That's why it is also relatively easy for authoritarian systems to maintain their power, because you, so, if, it, if you look at, if you are trying to give a deeper analysis of how the thought lines that are represented by the outcomes of the elections, how they are formed, it would be very difficult to draw these fault lines along the lines of social groups, of social classes. There are many, many other regional interests, uh, uh, gender, uh, various forms of way of life. So. Uh, class as a, as a basic concept of social analysis and ways and means of interpretation, I think is very, very difficult. But even, you remember, even Lukács uh, at his time was aware of that because he was also talking uh, false consciousness. <laughs> that there is uh, like a... Yeah, 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 about false consciousness. But you know that uh, you mentioned about consumerism and consumption. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, earlier, in the earlier period, uh, communist and commu communist uh, philosophers never discussed uh, consumerism and consumption as a problem, you know. They don't consider that communism in some one way um, related uh, to the problems of consumption. Actually, it was the claim, you know, that uh, and the communists, you will get uh, according to your needs and you mm. will work according to your possibilities, you know, it will depend. But you know, this uh, the concept of needs in the sense of uh, consumption was not developed. And we remember that uh, we couldn't uh, find the uh, um, commodities uh, in the communism uh, states, you know, because state was not oriented too much about uh, building of uh, commodity society, and it's uh, very interesting. Uh, in the, is it blindness of communism? Do you think, or some? What what does mean this one's this one's or this religious issues of communism? Why they don't consider uh, 
consumerism and commodities is a problem? Uh, well, uh, I think because the traditional communist ideology uh, focuses, uh, I think, too much on work. So work is considered to be, uh, uh, work produces value, right? Yeah. And uh, therefore, if uh, we uh, organize work and the division of labor a proper way, the, the, the profits uh, will not go to exploiters. And uh, today, uh, I think that uh, it's not so, so uh, on the one hand, I think uh, uh, we have to keep in mind that in modern societies, there are always uh, more or less, I, I, I do not have statistics, but definitely in Hungary, there are now more people who do not work than those who work. Because you have got children, you have got sick people, you have got the retired people. So, and uh, it is, uh, uh, their work doesn't so much regulate their lives. Yes, communists believe that work is the center of everything. Uh, this is, I think this is, this is no more the case. Plus, uh, with artificial intelligence, if you look into the future, uh, more and more, uh, fewer and fewer people can do more and more. I didn't thought. I, when I was very active, I traveled a lot. <clears throat> and you remember when, just uh, compare what uh, procedures you have to go, you had to go through at an airport 40 years ago, and what, how many people check you before, except for security now, uh, before you board the plane. There were, everything is automatic. You meet far, far fewer people where you see many people that is security but not the, the, the actual process. So you can deposit your luggage, you can, uh, so uh, therefore, and there are many, many other fields of life. In more and more shops, you, you, you do not have a cashier, but there is some kind of an automat where you place the product. Uh, there is a kind of a sign on the product, which, is, uh, scan, which is scanned and, and you use your credit card, yes? so. You don't need any people, and where earlier there might have been five cashiers, there is only one person who is trying to check the customers that everything is going all right. Therefore, I think the assumption that work is the most important issue in people's life, it has to be, I won't say it has to be forgotten, but uh, this is not the case. This is not the case. So this is, I think, one uh, problem, but of course, uh, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, that was not the case. That was not the case. And uh, a further problem is that look at the average age of people 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So the uh, the, the the pace of the increase of the population is dramatic, and uh, uh, if you respect privacy. You are not allowed to interfere into people's lives, whether they want to have six children or do not want to have children. So this is, and if they want to have many children, uh, they, uh, the society also has a kind of a morally defined obligation to help people, because, to help children, because it was not the children who decided about their birth, right? Uh, so they 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 have to be super. so i think this is uh, why uh, classical traditional uh, marxist and i would include even uh, post world war ii some uh, tendencies uh, was unable to uh, adjust itself to the to the uh, changing uh, circumstances and uh, for example also who would have believed uh, Marx, Luther Marx would have ever considered gender a, a key problem or in, in political life? And this is not, or uh, just uh, various forms of sexuality as a, they can be now in, in the upcoming elections in Hungary, this will be a key issue. And nobody I, speaks yeah. about, yes, uh, nobody, uh, it is a much more important issue than exploitation. 
And if I may add, uh, Zygmunt yeah. Bauman uh, yeah. has made an observation that uh, uh, Karl Marx did not predict uh, that um, workers, proletariat, will, will be substituted by educated, skilled yeah. employees in the offices yeah. who yeah. will have uh, um, their uh, work environment uh, under humane conditions, no yeah. longer factory but an office yeah. with uh, air condition or whatever, yeah. then uh, uh, the right for holidays, then the right uh, to have investments into your company uh, and uh, uh, capitalism itself has yeah. transformed a lot or at least is is trying uh, to become green capitalism uh, yeah. and uh, one more thing that business ethics has developed which was also something unimaginable most likely for the early communists uh, although we can criticize business ethics sometimes that uh, it does not solve the issue of greed, it does not solve uh, um, such uh, American corp corporation greed which caused the uh, uh, financial mm -hmm. market collapse in 2008 financial crisis. Uh, of course, we can criticize business ethics as going behind the uh, co corporative greed, but but all these things also probably uh, adding up to uh, communist critique, uh, at least classical version. Yes, 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 and if you look at the not only the similarities of uh, consumption habits uh, of the various layers of society, but the communication, the way the members of various groups communicate with each other. Uh, 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 it's uh, even in education, especially the American type, Anglo-Saxon type of education, the professors are considered to be you know, much more partners and uh, someone whom you buy in order to get a degree, right? Uh, you are paying the institution in order to get a degree. So it is not this absolute uh, uh, hierarchy and absolute superiority of people who are who are further up. Uh, in uh, in in Poland or in Hungary, uh, especially in Poland, uh, there are I think more traditional ways of everyday uh, communication preserved than in in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Definitely. Uh, the American uh, everyday life is much more easygoing uh, than, let's say, in, in, in Austria, for example. But the tendency is that uh, everyday communication is... Uh, so in everyday communication, the social differences can be easily revealed, right? So, so it's, uh, it, they are not so much visible, therefore, uh, the humiliating experiences that, for example, many proletariat workers of the 19th century experienced uh, are no more with us to the extent. And the, the worth of uh, uh, layer of societies is generally, maybe again I am wrong, but they are not approached by uh, any political party because they do not go to vote. Therefore, uh, it is not much worth investing into them. Sometimes uh, they uh, are trying to buy up their votes, but uh, they do not uh, deal uh, too much with uh, uh, their problems. Again, it's, it's, it's also interesting that uh, <coughs> the completely in a different, from a completely different angle than Marxist, work is uh, considered to be uh, more important than welfare. So our prime minister keeps saying, I am not interested in welfare, I am interested in workfare. And uh, there is some truth in this. I, I, I don't deny there is some truth in this, but uh, you have to be aware of the fact that uh, there are lots of people who are unable to work. There are many, many, many reasons for that. But you cannot simply say that. So, and how to properly deal with welfare, that I think is one of the uh, uh, 
most difficult problems of modern time, how to reconcile the call for dignity for everyone uh, and uh, the uh, because even uh, people who cannot uh, contribute to the society, their dignity also have to be respected. So the dignity of a beggar also has to be respected, right? And uh, but that's very very difficult because there is a tendency that uh, to uh, put all uh, people who are unable to contribute into one basket, so to say, and who are not useful for the society. And uh, uh, th this uh, approach could lead to movements to, in the 19th century, but it doesn't lead to, uh, to I think, political clashes in the, in the 20th or 21st century. Let's turn to the uh, your traumatic uh, co the concept of traumatic uh, history, and you mentioned Ricoeur and uh, Jürgen uh, Rusen, uh, Jorn, Jorn Rusen yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about um, uh, their concept and interpretation of uh, traumatic uh, traumatic memory and traumatic history. But uh, the communism trauma is uh, different and special, peculiar. And um, my question is, uh, first of all, uh, what is uh, the communism trauma, and in Hungary especially, what is it? Well, in on general terms, in general terms, the trauma stays with us if uh, something was not buried. So without a funeral, uh, there is no step further, and uh, you can have. Uh, uh, certain uh, formal uh, commemorations of the end of communism, and it did it, it happen. I think, for example, in Hungary, you could say that was the 16th of June 1989, uh, 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 when Imre Nagy, the leader of the 1956 revolution, was given a reburial. But uh, if you look at the other side of the coin, you cannot deny that reform communists, uh, so who were not uh, dogmatic Stalinist communists, but worked in the communist uh, power center, also did a lot for the changes. So you cannot simply, you can say that, but it is not the experience. Uh, for example, in uh, 1990, we frequent, of course, speak about the first free elections in Hungary, and then the former state party got only 10%. But 10% is also quite a lot. But the other hand, when it came to the municipal elections in the fall, that is less talked about, a great number of former party leaders were re-elected as, as independent candidates then. So, uh, and uh, whenever then it came to the uh, re-evaluation of their performance, of course, the legacy of communism frequently came up. I also uh, listed a number of, uh, in a very concrete issues, why I think the trauma of communism is still with us, because a number of issues related to the legacy of communism are still with us. Let me uh, list some of them. Uh, one is who initiated the changes, who is responsible for the starting of the process that led to the collapse of communism, and when did actually these changes start? Because you can say, well, changes might have started with the death of Stalin, right? You can say that changes might have started with the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, because it's a very long, long and there is no, I think, uh, no unanimous view against this. Now, a very uh, sensitive issue that is still with us and uh, occasionally comes onto the agenda is uh, about the peaceful transitions, uh, except for Romania, well, uh, and to some extent, German, uh, Eastern Germany, well, not so much, but, yet, but are peaceful transitions an asset or a liability? It's, uh, 
of course, uh, every single death is a terrible tragedy, but from a broader historical perspective, uh, uh, if you have a kind of a revol uh, real traditional revolutionary event, then uh, uh, that sh shows a certain borderline, that shows the termination of a historical period. Antal József, who was the first prime minister after the Czechs, who was a historian, had a famous saying that whenever people were complaining about uh, the survival of, of communist legacy, then he asked, why didn't you pre why didn't you do a revolution? Why didn't you make a revolution? So, uh, further on, uh, the problem, the limit, uh, that's absolutely topical, retrospective justice. That's a very, very serious problem because hundreds of thousands or millions of people haven't been compensated for their losses uh, uh, during communism, be it uh, moral or financial, uh, whatever losses. Uh, and uh, uh, a great number of people whose uh, uh, responsibility for a number of terrible atrocities is, uh, has been made pretty much public haven't been punished for that. So this is an open, this is, this is an open wound. Uh, then another approach, after the uh, transition, a lot of people showed up as great anti-communist heroes. So whoever was punished, maybe just as a simple criminal during communist times, was trying to present himself or herself as a great anti-communist hero, although the number of people who, who actively participated in uh, struggling in various forms against communism were quite small. I have a colleague, a good friend, Andras Bozoki, who is a political scientist, and he made a long, long, long-term research. Uh, his research question was, how many people are responsible for the transition in uh, Hungary? And his method was the following. He collected about... Uh, 50 manif various manifestations of uh, anti-communist protests, be them large-scale demonstrations, uh, publications, uh, etc. And uh, his, uh, he, had, he made hundreds of interviews. It took about 15 years, uh, this work. And uh, the outcome was very interesting that uh, about 2,000 people from various backgrounds uh, were one way or another responsible for these changes, but he called them the book that he wrote about this a rolling system change, because that means that it was not always the same. So it, did, it doesn't mean that the 2,000 people were active according to his uh, interpretation, by the way, the changes start in 79 and uh, go up to 94. So he looked at this time period and then there were, there is a very small hardcore continuity, but for example, a great number of people who were extremely active in the early phase didn't play any role after the collapse of communism that they were, that they were uh, fighting for. And uh, uh, the uh, further, in, and in general, I could say there are lots of ambiguities about the background of a number of people who are presenting themselves as great anti-communist heroes, but in fact were pretty much established in communist systems. I, I noticed you mentioned uh, uh, the forgiveness issue, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, punishment yeah. issue, um, uh, and I, I think that uh, Václav Havel and Adam Michnik, uh, they stick out as two great uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, dissidents who, uh, in under democracy conditions, uh, declared forgiveness to the former uh, communists, especially Adam Michnik uh, mm -hmm. surprised everyone when he was hugging Jaruzelski 
the now um, current government uh, uh, of Poland uh, showed uh, that video of Adam Michnik hugging and kissing uh, Jaruzelski as a compromise, uh, as supposedly uh, improper behavior of Adam Michnik. So how do you view and uh, how the society view regard uh, Adam Michnik's uh, perhaps extreme uh, than Václav Havel's perhaps more moderate this uh, forgiveness attitude, because some people say in the Czech Republic, this is bad consciousness, that there's no really re uh, any resolution. Where is the funeral of communism? And how? what is the case of Hungarian dissidents? Did Hungarian dissidents also promote this forgiveness of Mahatma Gandhi type? <laughs> uh, well, this is... Uh... One of the reasons why trauma is still with us is that there is no consensus about this issue. There is no consensus about this issue. So, and uh, it's uh, the Hungarian dissident uh, uh, can be divided into various groups. So there was a hardcore uh, dissident group which came mainly from urban, uh, 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 very well educated young intellectuals, many of them having been the children of leading communist bureaucrats, because they knew a lot about the system, and some of them turned against the system uh, for, for that reason. I think uh, uh, they uh, would not have been very uh, much willing to hug uh, uh, for former communists, but there was another group coming mainly from uh, rural intellectuals, uh, following some traditional legacy of, uh, of uh, Hungarian nationalism that connected the best legacies to the peasantry, to uh, agriculture, rural society. And there were also some similar uh, personalities in the communist leadership who came from the rural society. The best example for that is uh, Imre Pozsgai. Pozsgai was a top-level leader. He, at the end of his uh, communist time career, he was a Politburo member. And uh, he went uh, to see a meeting of the dissident uh, in, uh, in 87. Uh, and uh, <coughs> he was on very good terms with this more uh, rural type of dissidents, but he was not on very good terms uh, with the more what, what urban cosmopolitan type of, uh, of, uh, of communists. On the lower level, so not by, uh, uh, Politburo members, but local uh, party uh, offices, etc., there are many, many uh, differences because there were huge uh, regional differences, how a local communist party, regional communist party secretary behaved. In some uh, cases, uh, he or she was integrated into the post-communist establishment, in other cases not. Uh, so it's uh, uh, very difficult to give a simple and uh, black and white uh, answer uh, to this. Uh, uh, the, I think the, the more uh, uh, broader horizon a dissident had, the more open-minded a dissident was, uh, the more willing he or she was ready to make compromises in the last phase of communism and uh, during the transition with uh, the party uh, leadership because uh, that was absolutely necessary because uh, there were the whole process in Hungary was a negotiating negotiate, so as uh, Professor Turkish called it the negotiated revolution and uh, if they hadn't showed some respect towards each other then it wouldn't have been possible to to have uh, to have negotiations and uh, Part of the deal, so to say, was uh, that uh, a number of these uh, former communist leaders could survive in business because the 
many of them by 1890 were pretty well educated and were very well connected in, in various businesses. So uh, maybe they wouldn't have hugged each other, but uh, they uh, were ready to let them leave. Plus, the, uh, we, we mustn't uh, uh, assume that uh, in rural Hungary or in smaller villages, in smaller towns, the models are on the same as on a national level. Because in a small community where everyone knows everyone, the major strategy is survival, right? The, the deeply imprinted instinct of many local societies is that they have a collective memory, and this is still a quite a warm memory because as we know that they can so at least for 80 years or so, and they know we have survived a lot of things. And therefore, it's not very wise to totally exclude someone from the society because you never know what is coming up, right? And uh, therefore, in, in many cases, they were, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite uh, tolerant uh, with each other. Of course, the, the main stream rhetoric is strongly anti-communist and calls for uh, and explains the lack of proper punishment as one of the reasons for the present day difficulties. But the closer you come to the to the fabric of, of society, the deeper lying fabric, deeper lying element of society, I think the more uh, uh, complicated it is. Because some, there were points when very radical and uh, very well-structured anti-communist argument came from former party bureaucrats. And not only because they were simply changing sides, but, but they, if you think of uh, Wehrmacht soldiers, or even sometimes SS, they were also changing sides, yes. Not only because of they wanted to save themselves, but this is how they realized that things wouldn't go the same way as they did before. And here, there, it's interesting uh, to compare two parts of our uh, discussion. In the beginning, we discussed about uh, some uh, communist spirit, communism spirit and uh, idea. And the second part about uh, more about uh, nomenclature, nomenclature and uh, why the, our history of communism is not buried, still uh, not buried. And uh, there I see the problem that you remember from Karl Marx's manifesto of communism, that, uh, that uh, communism is ghost, uh, uh, yes, yeah. uh, which uh, walks uh, in Europe, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> it means uh, it's not about uh, per persons and not political parties. It's about some kind of spiritual idea, which uh, is still alive. And uh, contemporary young people inspired by idea, the ghost of communism, they accuse this nomenclature, which you mentioned in the second part, they accuse this nomenclature in treating as a treaters uh, of communism, you know, as those who never been a real communism, as those uh, uh, that uh, the false consciousness is uh, the character of nomenclature, but not of them, the youngest, uh, you know, generation. And uh, this conflict, uh, how do you see this conflict? Uh, um, is it very marginal in uh, Hungary or just visible? I think this uh, uh, radical survival of traditional uh, revolutionary Marxism is totally marginal, totally marginal, just the same way as the radical, anti-Semitic, uh, racist, etc. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, radical right is also, I think, absolutely marginal. Uh, they Occasionally they can be visible, but even the radical right is more visible than the radical left. There is a, a small uh, 
Par Communist Party, but it doesn't even call itself Communist Party, but Workers Party, because it is frightened. But if, if they use <laughs> the concept of communist, that they 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 might get uh, at an election perhaps uh, tens of thousands of votes altogether in the whole country. Uh, you know, it is. Do you know? Do you have an estimate how many parties have been registered for the elections now? More than 300, it seems. Oh. <laughs> More than 300, because if you uh, meet certain bureaucratic conditions, you can register as a party and then you get some financial uh, support. And uh, so they, they, they are totally, totally negligible. They do not have any influence uh, on people. Uh, I think the number, again, maybe I am wrong, but uh, the sexual problems, uh, gender problems, uh, drug problems, uh, I think now are much more important for uh, a number of young people uh, than uh, keeping to the old tradition of uh, of communism. It's, uh, for example, the, the very young, the uh, they do not understand how borders could be closed. So I, I cannot explain it to my students either. So they simply don't understand. So that they don't understand the um, communication. How, how is that that you couldn't make a call? Why, why couldn't you make a call? So it's a, it's a well, convertible currency. They don't understand. Money is money, they say. I, I don't understand what is convertible and, and not convertible. Of course, they understand that, that some currencies are worse than others, but that, that there are two. So the, the worst elements of uh, everyday life of, uh, of communists, uh, <laughs> nobody, uh, nobody remembers. This is something that, uh, that, that nobody remembers. So therefore, I think they, they are not inspired for that. I have the feeling, but on the basis of talking students and younger children, so teenagers, what really inspires them is technology. Uh, various new forms of technology. Sometimes a 16 year old uh, tells me that Facebook, that is for old people like you. And uh, so they have many, many levels of, of communication and they can organize themselves and these uh, networks, I would say, hardly reflect uh, social statuses, I think. Uh, so it's uh, 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 the generational gaps, uh, I think, are very important, but the, the, the generational protest is much more along the lines of uh, along the about the uh, unwillingness of elder people to make as much use of modern technologies as possible. So this is their major complaint, not uh, the heroic uh, uh, memory of. of uh, if I may, uh, um, Professor Poker, I would like to shift our conversation uh, because uh, towards uh, geopolitical uh, our current uh, situation. Um, our program is going towards the end, and I'm so eager to ask you, as a Hungarian person, how do you see um, uh, uh, Viktor uh, uh, Orban's uh, move uh, to go uh, for support for Vladimir Putin uh, in this uh, militaristic potential the conflict, God forbid, the war between Russia and Ukraine mm -hmm. and the NATO. Um, and uh, Hungary, uh, uh, sorry to say Hungary, uh, Orban is not in the entire country, but mm -hmm. he legitimately represents the country. And he announced uh, in Moscow for the journalist that uh, look at the Hungarian model. Hungary is a NATO member, EU member, yet it is a friend of Moscow. Uh, how how would you comment in this um, uh, current geopolitical uh, context? 
No, the, no, you have to be aware of the complexity of the situation of small countries and the leaders of, of small countries. I think he is uh, guided by the traditional principle of, of many Hungarians trying to survive. Uh, uh, there were survival strategies when Hungary was surrounded by the Ottomans on the one side and the Habsburgs on the other side, Germans on one side, other side. I think this is just the reflection of uh, of this uh, strategy, because uh, that uh, uh, you look uh, for what Macron uh, two days after Orban, Macron went uh, to Moscow and then he went to Ukraine. Of course, the difference is that Orban that didn't go to the Ukraine, but the problem there is that there is a, a large Hungarian minority in the Subcarpathian regions and. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian government doesn't treat, or that is at least uh, the, our perception, doesn't treat this Hungarian minority properly. So I think uh, officially then Orban also called himself as an icebreaker, so that he is uh, trying to move. Uh, I think that under these conditions, uh, uh, this pragmatic approach uh, has to be tolerated. I. I because uh, if you uh, uh, look at the gas supply that is needed for uh, for Hungary and for small countries, so all the all the practical things, uh, 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 the Russia uh, can do lots of harm to Hungary if it it wants to, uh, and uh, this uh, approach is an attempt at uh, uh, trying, uh, I think, uh, uh, to avoid it. So, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, everyone knows what is going on in, in Russian domestic politics, uh, uh, but uh, it is a counter argument against this that if we, uh, I know it is very harsh, but if we uh, expect other countries not to interfere into our domestic affairs. We can say we shouldn't interfere into other countries' domestic affairs. It is terrible. Yes, I know it. it is, this is a terrible. This is something terrible because there is some kind of an overall uh, humanitarian responsibility. But I think in every society there is a division of labor. So if you are a free intellectual, you can speak on behalf of universal human rights. But if you are a prime minister responsible for the gas supply of your country for this winter, you cannot uh, represent uh, this uh, rhetoric. So uh, I think that it is very difficult because during my active career, I was always trying to encourage my uh, colleagues to talk to politicians, not just to criticize them. And I was also trying to encourage politicians to listen to to scholars that please try to understand that we have a completely different approach to the same problem. But that is uh, how a kind of a democracy works, uh, because uh, we, we have to share uh, thoughts with each other. So if uh, as long as there are institutions and personalities and media where you can represent a different view, I think uh, as long as that is the case, this is not a problem. It, it's an issue, but not an unresolvable problem. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, today it's unimaginable for uh, Kaczynski or, or, or Duda to go to Moscow. We have this uh, uh, Central European Visegrad countries, uh, interesting uh, similarities and uh, differences. Uh, Poland, just as Hungary, is um, sort of anti-Brussels, anti but uh, Poland is uh, also anti-Moscow, especially after the uh, catastrophe in 2010, the airplane crash, <laughs> Polish elite in Smolensk airport. And Hungary is, while being uh, anti-Brussels politics, yet at the same time, is uh, friendly with with Moscow, the, think, which is not a Polish case, I, not a Baltic states. Kind. I think the, 
disintegration this is, of this, the, this is to be extended history yes sir. Uh, uh, the soviet union or russia didn't participate in the partitioning of hungary yes so <laughs> so uh, of course the soviet union kept control over hungary as a member of the soviet bloc but uh, uh, this long term legacy so from the late 18th century to 1918 that russia is responsible for partially responsible for carving up Poland, and uh, there was no Polish, uh, I mean, uh, Soviet-Hungarian war as the post, there was a Second World War, right? The Second World War, but that is not a Hungarian-Soviet uh, war, but it is a Hungary as an ally of Germany is participating in the war. But if you think of the post-World War I Polish-Soviet war, or Polish uh, Bolshevik war that is uh, very different. So it's uh, I I have lots of contacts to uh, to Polish colleagues, uh, and we shall never have the same understanding of the post World War One uh, situation. Uh, it, I I am in the the head of the academic council of an uh, organization called European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity. And we are trying to do things uh, along the lines of reconciliation. And among others, we set up a big exhibition that is now traveling all over, not only Europe, but also in Japan, for example. It is uh, Europe after the First World War, 1918, 1923. And it was not uh, easy to set up a exhibition uh, where uh, the Hungarian and the Polish you are also reflected. The only uh, common denominator that we can have along this line is, but even that is uh, not fully accepted all of us, that uh, war is not a good thing. Uh, but even that is sometimes uh, cannot be shared because there are situations when only war or the continuation of a war uh, seems to be the proper means uh, for resolving something, like also in the Polish-Soviet war uh, after the First World War. So if the Poles hadn't been fighting, the, the situation would have been completely uh, different. Uh, so, uh, so these differences are, uh, are fully uh, understandable. And uh, of course, I don't know anything about the internal functioning of the V4, but I am sure or I have the impression that these differences do not uh, uh, present a threat to the willingness to lobbying together uh, in Brussels. Plus, you, and of course, the size is also matter. Uh, Poland is, uh, I wouldn't say a great power, but an upper middle sized power, whereas Hungary will always remain a, a very small uh, power. So among the V4, Poland is, is still, a, I think, a special, a special case. Uh, and it's very important so, uh, to uh, uh, maintain for all the countries for various reasons to maintain the integrity uh, of of this way for uh, I don't know whether we have mentioned it in our previous conversation that two Austrian uh, colleagues Erhard Buzek and Emil Briggs have written a book about uh, this problem uh, in 86 they published a book about how they as Austrian politicians and scholars see Central Europe, and now they, uh, in uh, 2018, they rewrote it, so to say, and uh, according to their uh, interpretation, it is, of course, it would call for a longer elaboration, but they argue that uh, if uh, the European Union is unable to properly deal with this V4 uh, group in Central Europe, and, and then that will cause difficulties. So in a, in a simplified, uh, straightforward sense, they uh, say that uh, the future of Europe to a very great extent depends on whether they are able to integrate uh, this uh, group. And it makes sense because they are the closest to Russia, right? They are the 
closer to the Ukraine. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very different perspective to look at this problem from the west of France than from the east of Hungary. Perhaps uh, Gintotas would like to ask the last question or yes. to summarize. <laughs> So the I, microphone is off. Microphone. Uh, we need to summarize our uh, talking, you know, and uh, actually we uh, try to interpret all, not only Hungary, but as well uh, Central Eastern Europe. And uh, we see here there's some kind of destiny of uh, communism heritage, you know, for all this region, in which uh, becomes uh, different from uh, not only from Western uh, Europe, but as well from the Asia, which uh, uh, accepted communism and interpreted it in completely different way than Central Eastern Europe. How do you think uh, the importance of this uh, uh, Central Eastern communism? Now, I'm talking not about the whole world, but very special uh, experience, uh, conscious experience of communism in Central Eastern Europe. Um, does it unite us in some one way? Because uh, listen, questions of Thomas, we could understand that, that okay, uh, from the one side we criticize, uh, uh, criticize com uh, heritage of communism, but from the other side we found some sort of uh, some sort of uh, the same topic, the same consciousness mm -hmm. in this Central Eastern Europe, which is different from Russia communism, mm -hmm. from Asia communism, and they actually were different from uh, Western countries. Uh, what does mean this one uh, element of uh, heritage communism which unites us? Yes, I think this is a very uh, proper question. I think perhaps um, collective suffering uh, might uh, frequently be a good uh, uh, common denominator of uh, different uh, societies and countries. So, uh, in of course, in different forms, because how could you compare life in Romania in the mid-80s to life in Hungary in the mid-80s, but still, uh, there is uh, something uh, that, uh, uh, is, that communism is uh, uh, thought of as something having been imposed on these societies and uh, different as the end of the system might have been in different countries, there was also some kind of an experience of, of having got rid of it. Uh, it doesn't mean that for all layers of all societies getting rid of communism was an extremely heroic, uh, positive experience, but it is still something that we share. So, obviously, uh, even uh, the memory of this thing for younger generations brings uh, people or young people from Poland and uh, let's say even Serbia closer together than uh, young children from uh, Britain and let's say Croatia. So uh, I think this is something that uh, helps in a way the cohesion of this uh, East Central European community, not only because of the legacy, but also the history, but also the motive that uh, survived. So let me give you just a, an example from an everyday experience. So once uh, I uh, was with the American student, so just moving around in Budapest, and uh, there was a there were uh, American students and also some students from various East European countries. And uh, a small accident happened, not very serious, but a small accident happened with one of the American students. And then the American student said, oh yes, let's call the police immediately. The East European said, let us not call the police because that might mix up things. Let us try to, to solve the problems ourselves. The American said, why? because why not? And they said, well, you know, police is always a problem. Whereas from an American uh, point of view, police is there to serve you, to, to help you. So I think uh, uh, Romanians, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks could easily understand this uh, attitude, whereas the American was unable to, <laughs> to understand uh, 
uh, this uh, attitude. So I think in that sense, the, the memory legacy heritage of communism in a way unites us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I would like to remind our uh, dear viewers that you just watched our program called Freely and Critically, run by Social and Political Critique Center from Vitotas Magnus University, Konos, Lithuania. Uh, it is me, Thomas Kowalowskis, and Professor Gendotas Mojekis, and uh, thank you very much to Attila Pok, our special uh, guest uh, today, who illuminated us on so many subtleties of communist heritage. Thank, thank you very much. Thank for you it. very much. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Goodbye.